times. New York Times for me is about the things I need to be Perfect. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first Mayor's Megawatt Challenge webinar of 2022, getting the most out of your building automation system. As always, the content for our webinars is driven by our members. And after meeting with all of our members earlier this year, BAS was chosen as one of the priority areas of interest for this coming year. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Catherine Wilson. I'm the manager of the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge, a program that's been working with municipalities since 2003 to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in their own facilities. Before diving in, we'd like to thank our webinar sponsors, Setpoint Building Automation and Yorkland Controls, for not only being sponsors of this webinar, but for providing their insights into what municipalities should be considering when evaluating new and existing building automation systems and fault detection and diagnostics. Uh, next slide shows today's agenda. So after the welcome and introductions, we'll dive right into what you should be considering when procuring a new BAS. We'll then get into how to evaluate the performance of existing BAS with the focus on preventative maintenance. We'll then get into trends and why they are such a critical component of any BAS. Discussion will include how you can ensure trends are set up and archived and how trend data can be used to gain insights into building performance. We'll then discuss how this can be taken to the next level using fault detection and diagnostics. We'll wrap things up with a question and answer period with the audience. So a couple of logistics, uh, please use the chat for technology related questions or questions unrelated to content. For content related questions, please please use the Q&A option. This is so the questions can be logged for the Q&A document to be sent out after the webinar. Please feel free to ask questions throughout the webinar. Straightforward questions may be answered in the Q&A as we go, but most will be answered during the audience Q&A session at the end. So any questions we can't get to will be answered and circulated in that Q&A document that I mentioned after the webinar. So the next slide, please. This webinar will be conversation style with an excellent group of panelists representing both municipalities and vendors. As with all of our webinars, we strive to bring in the municipal perspective as folks always wanna hear about the experience, challenges and lessons learned from their municipal counterparts. So I will now ask the panelists to introduce themselves. So Adam, why don't we start with you? Good afternoon. My name is Adam McMullen. I'm the manager of energy for the city of Barrie and um, uh, part of our optimization efforts involves building automation systems. So I'm going to speak a bit to that today. Awesome. I'm sure folks will be really interested to hear what you have to say on that front. Thank you. Uh, Dave, why don't you go next? Hi everyone. My name is Dave Cano, energy solutions manager at the town of Oakville. And uh, as Adam, uh, a key component for energy management program at the town of Oakville is our BAS and how we better use it to, to support our, our facilities and operations. Awesome, thanks, Dave. Uh, Adrian, why don't you go next? Uh, hi, my name is Adrian Chiquetto. Um, I've been in the building automation industry since 2007. Uh, I've had a few different roles during that time. Um, but currently, I'm the account manager over at Setpoint Building Automation out of Concord. Um, just looking forward to participating in this discussion today with you guys. Awesome. Thanks, Adrian. Uh, Paul, why don't you go next? All right. Hello, everyone. And uh, thanks for having me today. My name is Paul Burquist. I'm the business development manager for Sky Foundry. We are the maker of an analytics software platform called SkySpark. And today I'm here supporting our Canadian distributor, Yorkland Controls, who is a sponsor for today's event. Um, looking forward to the discussion today. Thank you. Thanks, Paul. And Frank, why don't you? Sure. <clears throat> so, yeah, so uh, th thanks, Catherine. Appreciate it. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. My name is Frank Camilleri. Um, I'm the VP uh, here at Enterlife uh, Consulting. We provide technical direction to the programs, uh, specifically uh, Marriage Megawatt Challenge. And today, my role here is to uh, have, facilitate the conversation uh, through slides and interaction with the, with the panelists. Awesome. Well, thanks, everyone. Really looking forward to this discussion. 
why don't we dive right in? Why is BAS so important? <laughs> Great, thanks, Catherine, appreciate it. Uh, so, <clears throat> you know, uh, probably most people on this webinar know how, how important uh, BAS, but it's uh, becoming more and more increasingly important for energy efficiency, and uh, municipalities are leading the charge with respect to uh, energy efficiency and in, and in, in getting to zero carbon. So, um, can't stress that enough that a BAS is just essential to have. Uh, and hence why the uh, why the webinar and the topic we're, we're discussing today. Um, one of the things that I'd like to highlight uh, that has been evolving over probably over the last five or so years is uh, is that uh, BAS uh, is appropriate for all building sizes and complexities. Uh, no building is too small for a BAS. Once a municipality has uh, some BAS in their um, infrastructure in their portfolio with with some of their bigger buildings. Uh, this uh, no no building is too small. Um, uh, the, you know, there's uh, the, the BAS uh, manufacturers. Many of them are, are producing modular type of components, and they also have a lot of smaller controllers to handle smaller facilities with fewer points. Uh, and they tend to have uh, all they need really is uh, internet access or cellular access to access um, uh, Wi-Fi. Um, so an example might be, and we're, uh, we're seeing uh, um, even for small small places where they have maybe a unit unit ventilator or shed or something, um, we're seeing that more and more common with just a controller that uh, that will monitor key points and and, and deal with um, optimizing that space. Uh, and um, again, fairly small small place with maybe just six seven points, uh, but uh, and it's becoming more and more uh, economically attractive. They're probably again five more more closer to ten years ago the the general rule of thumb was 10,000 square feet was kind of used as as sort of the border where anything below that maybe a BAS wasn't uh, cost effective. It was just too expensive, but that has evolved. That's changed a lot. So I uh, just wanted to stress that, <clears throat> especially as we start to future, as we uh, we start to future proof, um, uh, you know, uh, municipalities start thinking about uh, going forward and, and future proofing things like uh, standalone controllers become problematic uh, when you're trying to integrate over a wider, a wider network of facilities, right? So I just wanted to highlight that point because we think that that's extremely important. Okay. Uh, so key criteria when considering a new BAS or replacing an existing one. So uh, goal today, we'll talk on uh, uh, about some really key topics over here. Openness is, is a natural one that uh, is important. We'll talk a little bit more about what that means. Um, secure data communication in this age of, um, you know, uh, IT attacks and fraud, and uh, uh, it's going to be important to discuss that. And um, trends in data storage can't be stressed enough. Uh, that's what's needed, especially these days, to really optimize your facilities and get to low carbon. Uh, uh, things like alarming, uh, doing so remotely, and its importance, and, and how to do it in a way that's manageable. <clears throat> Support of uh, legacy products and, and, and service in general uh, to these, these products and more uh, is important important understanding some of the first service uh, <clears throat> frameworks that exist out there. Uh, training, uh, again, we're seeing more and more uh, building owners, building operators, that uh, are taking charge, uh, are more proactively involved. So training in their facilities. So I uh, want to discuss a little bit about the training options that are available currently. Uh, documentation uh, is fundamental. Um, to, uh, to uh, maintaining a BAS and going forward to the importance of it. And we'll explain a little bit more about why it's important. <clears throat> and this whole, this whole field of sustainability, uh, we thought we'd highlight uh, sustainable manufacturing as most municipalities have to deal with, with waste and recycling. So we thought that would be a good uh, component to, to discuss. <laughs> okay, so moving on. So this, uh, the openness, the open protocol, many of you are probably aware of BACnet has been around for a bit, but I wanted to highlight the, um, uh, the fact that uh, what, was it, what, what's, what was its goal in, in its original intention? And um, you know, its intention was really to facilitate interoperable communication between vendors at the equipment level. So being able to communicate, the BAS being able to communicate with the boilers, chillers, um, and uh, rooftop units, you know, things, things of that nature with the BAS. Uh, prior to establishing BACnet protocol, <clears throat> there were a lot of proprietary type of communication protocols uh, that was making it very difficult um, and very challenging for owners, uh, period, to have to deal with all these different uh, um, proprietary systems. So uh, we've evolved, uh, BACnet's been around for a while. 
Uh, but the good thing about it is that it's not owned by any one company. Uh, it is managed by uh, ASHRAE. Um, and uh, the interop interoperability of, uh, of, of BAS uh, companies and their, and their uh, products are verified by, again, a third party. So this is non-biased. It's through BACnet testing laboratories. And you can see that even on the website for BACnet testing BTL, uh, you'll find ratings for each of the uh, BAS vendors <coughs> that you may be considering in the future and, and how they rank with certain factors in terms of open protocol. Okay. Okay, next. So a little, some, a little bit of background to try to understand some of the um, more detail with, uh, with BACnet. So there is this understanding of uh, trying to understand native BACnet. So basically, uh, a BAS's native BACnet is basically comes out of the box ready to communicate with all other products using that use uh, BACnet protocol. So there's uh, you know, things like VFDs and borders and chillers that have, may have BACnet cards and uh, uh, BAS that is uh, native BACnet can communicate directly with it without the, the need of any other devices. If a BAS or equipment <coughs> is not native BACnet, there's a need for a translator or a gateway. And the reason I bring this up is, is that <clears throat> just need to be mindful, not that, not that anything's wrong with having a translator or a gateway, but just one should be aware of, of that the fact that this introduces uh, you know more equipment into the equation and makes it a little bit more challenging to troubleshoot and um, and so that's why we want to talk a little bit that want to highlight that <clears throat> what I want to highlight uh, too is is what back that is not um, there is this um, perception out there that uh, you know, uh, although communication between equipment follows a common protocol, things like programming and to, an certain, to a certain extent graphics within ABAS is still very much proprietary. Um, so we need to understand and what, they, what we mean by that is, is that if you have a Siemens system, say a, 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 a Delta or a reliable control system is that they can communicate with each other in terms of reading, but the inherent programming that's done within the, 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 the actual panels, the controllers themselves, that is, that is very much proprietary still. Right. And, and nothing is wrong with that, but just wanted to make sure that, that we understand that, 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 uh, that even though there's a common protocol to communicate uh, the actual, there's certain things that are still and remain proprietary. Uh, so that brings me uh, to some questions. Uh, uh, Adrian, um, just wanted to uh, ask you, uh, what are the challenges, you know, having all, that, all the experience in the, in the BAS field and being an account manager, uh, what are the challenges you see in the field when dealing with equipment that's not native BACnet? Um, thanks, Frank. I'd say, you know, with native backend, it definitely provides a, a much easier way to interoperate with that with that piece of equipment. Um, like you said earlier, you know, it's just out of the box, a little bit easier to work with. Um, most of the time, it's because those kinds of controllers will have, um, you know, a, a fully fleshed out like descriptor list in them um, for all their backend objects. Plus, there's also usually very good supporting documentation from those manufacturers as well. Um, <laughs> When the device is a gateway, um, and, and like you said, right, I want to stress the point as well as you, there's nothing wrong with a gateway. Um, most of the time, those gateways will be BTL listed themselves, which is a good thing. Um, where the problems start to happen, I would say, is, is more so with how that gateway has been set up or programmed in the sense that um, the object names a lot of times are, are the issues. So, you know, we run into scenarios where you know, you look inside of, or you discover a controller and the object names are, are just, you know, AI5, something like that, as opposed to um, supply air temperature, which would be something that you know, we can understand a lot easier um, through an English, you know, an English descriptor, basically. Okay. Okay. No, no thanks. That's, that's, that's very, that's very helpful. Again, I want to stress here that, it, that nothing is wrong with having a translator and gateway, but just, it, it's man, just managing your expectations and being in, in the know that there, there will be a requirement to have a translator in a, in a great way. And then there, there can be some uh, difficulty uh, with, with trans, you know, troubleshooting if, if it's not done properly, if it's not done in a certain manner. So I guess this is more for everyone's information. Um, yep. So Adrian, just to continue the conversation, um, you know, given back and it's been around for a while, and um, uh, what do you see in terms of equipment, equipment manufacturers adopting uh, uh, adopting BACnet. I mean, what what what's what's been happening lately in the in the marketplace with the, you know the the big BAS providers out there uh, with respect to BACnet? What are you are native BACnet? Are you seeing a trend uh, in that direction or? So I, I definitely see. I mean, all the all the major vendors on the BAS side absolutely have a, a BACnet solution um, that's out there. Um, on the equipment manufacturer side, um, you know, we're seeing we're seeing a lot of equipment being supplied with either you know their own controller that they've developed or a, a controller that, you know, maybe they've rebranded. Um, 
and usually those kinds of, of scenarios have um, pretty good descriptors, pretty good functionality, kind of what we touched on before. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's typically what we're seeing at this point. Okay. Okay, so it's it's good to see that the trend is starting to happen. And we, we know Backnet's been around, but I, uh, but uh, again, sometimes there's there's slow adopt, adoptability, right? And, and and glad to see that we're we're seeing that. In terms of uh, you know equipment uh, types uh, that there seem to be sort of leading the charge on this piece. What what, what co equipment uh, types, if you will, are are sort of leading the charge, and which ones are the laggards? Just again, just for people to understand uh, and you know again manage their expectations when they're out there. Yeah, I, I'd say definitely the, um, you know, the, the larger pieces of equipment, the more facility like level piece of equipment. So something like a chiller or like yep. rooftop unit, um, even uh, VFDs actually have, have come a really long way. Um, any of the major leaders in, in, you know, drive technology, they, they all have pretty good uh, backend integration built into the drives um, out of the box, okay. which is, which is nice to have. Yep. Um Laggers, I mean, I'd, I'd say sometimes, you know, things like, you know, sometimes certain boiler manufacturers, um, other smaller pieces of equipment too, I would say where, you know, they're, they're it's almost like they're offering a uh, backnet gateway kind of to meet a, a spec requirement as opposed to actually like engineering a proper solution. So okay. sometimes that can get in the way, but I mean, it's, it's tough to, to pick, you know, one or the, or the other, right? Okay. No, no, no. That, that's good. That's helpful. I mean, said, again, eventually we're going to see this trend. I'm sure that all equipment type providers, especially the mainstream ones like, you know, chillers and, and VFD providers, rooftop units, you know, they're in the game and they'll try to design a solution. As and I better. definitely, oh, sorry, Frank. I, I definitely oh, think though, like now seems to be a, a good time where, where everybody is, is really driving towards, you know, good solutions at this point. So there's, okay. there's definitely an improvement there, I would say. Okay, good, good, good to hear. Good to hear. Okay, thank you, thank you, Adrian. Appreciate it. Uh, just moving along to uh, oops, just switching over to this slide here. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Okay, yes. Um, talking about uh, again, just the, the open protocol and just backnet in general continued um, uh, dealing with multiple vendors. So, so just you know, like to preface this by saying it's very having worked with many, many different uh, municipalities and, and, and other vertical markets, you know, multiple BS vendors is not uncommon. In fact, a lot of them, um, a lot of municipalities in particular for procurement reasons want to have, uh, you know, more than one vendor to, uh, uh, to, 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 to depend on. Um, and um, uh, so, so anyways, that's, that's sort of the preface behind this, uh, um, uh, you know, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, BAS, uh, multiple vendors in, in the context of those within the same facility and those within different facilities. So just some, some points to highlight within the same facility, as I mentioned earlier, that if both BAS uh, manufacturers in that same facility are, are back net, they can definitely communicate with each other, but just be mindful that, you know, programming uh, and again, to the graphics as well is fairly is fairly unique to each manu BAS manufacturer. Uh, not that that should stop you from changing vendors. If, you, if you're having difficulties, if your evaluation of a BAS provider, uh, you know, leads you down one other path than that, what you have currently in your system. But, uh, but I just wanted you to uh, want to make sure we highlight that point. So you're aware of it and you just have to deal with that. That's all. Um, Within uh, different facilities, you know, you know, then, um, and th which is very common. Again, we're, we we notice this a, a lot with with clients that uh, have to manage uh, a portfolio of buildings. Uh, just some of the things that need to be considered, I guess, uh, especially for for some of the municipalities uh, who are starting to venture uh, in getting their 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 buildings um, automated. Uh, you need to, you need to think about internal staff training because now there's more than one vendor. You need to become a little bit more familiar with these different uh, types of of uh, facilities as well. Um, the um, <clears throat> what I'd like to do is, is also talk about uh, the fact that there's because there's multiple B you have to have multiple BAS service companies right so um, so so that's something to be very mindful of um, and, um, and multiple sets of hardware and, and central servers sometimes are, are, are things you may have to keep in mind so um, so uh, this brings me a good question here this is where I think um, you know uh, getting uh, the municipalities perspective would be would be interesting so so Adam um, we particularly as, as we know each other well. Uh, we understand that you have three main sort of BAS manufacturers in your facilities. Um, what do you look for in a, in a, in a new BAS? Um, and uh, yes, from a procurement perspective and also just from an operational perspective. Um, great question. It's, uh, it's very challenging <clears throat> um, to scope out um, 
projects when it comes to like new construction or replacing a, a BAS in a large building. So what we're particularly interested in is ensuring that all of the, the points um, on a piece of equipment will be available and uh, readable and writable. So what I mean is that if you have a rooftop unit, for example, you wanna be able to control the outdoor air damper directly, say through the building automation, as opposed to the internal controller of that piece of equipment. And that, that's very challenging because the piece of equipment may have an internal controller that doesn't necessarily allow you to do that. So it's more so not just your building automation vendor and specifications, it's what equipment are you going to have and can you specify that equipment uh, uh, enable connectivity to the building automation. So we're doing this with one small facility that we're, we're doing where we're, we're putting a terminal strip on a package unit, which essentially means that we can directly input the building automation to that terminal strip and directly control essentially that package unit. Oh, so okay. that's one of the key issues is actually the integration and understanding what equipment you have and, and knowing that the building automation that you are specifying can connect to that appropriately. Okay, that, that's a very good point. We uh, uh, Rooftop units in particular is a great example. So I'm glad that you highlighted that because uh, we, we deal with a lot of, um, again, uh, building operators, building owners, if you will, that have to deal with rooftop units. And, and they're, they're one piece of equipment amongst others that, uh, like you mentioned, uh, have uh, their own individual controllers. And, and some of them, again, uh, don't allow you to control the individual components to your point. And, and, uh, and, and thanks for highlighting that because in this day and age, uh, and especially if you're trying to future proof for, for, for low carbon, you really need to get into the details. So at least you should have that flexibility of getting into the details and optimizing that programming, having control of the end devices is, is becoming more and more essential and critical. So when you, so that, so thanks for, for stressing that that's, that's really important, especially these days. And you're trying to future proof uh, yourselves. Mm -hmm. Uh, Dave, just on, on from your perspective, uh, um, uh, how many? Uh, my understanding is that you only you have one main BAS uh, provider in in your uh, in your facilities. Is that right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. So before 2011, we did have a few different vendors. Okay. However, when we started bidding uh, for all our new construction projects, we realized that we were giving the contracts to the same company over and over again, yeah. and we realized there were some benefits of just moving to one vendor in particular. Uh, so uh, since then, we've installed uh, RIAs in 17 of our facilities, and they're all controlled under the same vendor. Okay. Okay. Good. That's that's good. And 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 we understand that uh, again. There is no right or wrong answer here. It's really there's benefits, pros and cons with with either one. And we know that uh, uh, you know Adam has multiple vendors, right? So uh, which is good. We want to hear from both perspectives and the motivations why you you went that way. So which is good. Um, with respect to um, um, you know, the uh, BAS protocols yourselves. I mean, is there any any comments that you'd like to add to what uh, perhaps what Adam said about what do you look for in, in that vendor and what you expect from your single vendor there, if you will? Sure. So we, we definitely expect to use BACnet as our main communications protocol. Uh, for out of those 17 facilities, we do know that we have three that are still using uh, an older communication protocol. And we know and we've been told by this vendor that they're not going to be supporting that anymore moving in the future. So we know that uh, if we want to continue moving forward with this particular vendor, and, and in general, just to make sure that we can maintain all the programming and the application as we require them, we will need to update protocols to, to the BACnet. So nice. this year we'll be undertaking a, a project to convert those three facilities to, to BACnet. Oh, okay. Okay. That's, that's, that's interesting. Yes. And, and, and you're right, I guess, you know, back then it kind of started happening about 20 plus years ago, but you're right. It's, it's, uh, and, and, the, and the BAS companies have been trying to adopt it, but, but yeah, but that's a real life issue you guys are dealing with, right? The fact that you still have some facilities that, that under the old proprietary type of communication and, but glad to hear that you guys are working towards getting onto BACnet and that open protocol. Thanks. Thanks very much. Dave. appreciate it. Sure. Um, so just uh, talking a little bit about secure data communication. So uh, one of the things that like can't stress enough is really the remote communication from the onset. So, um, you know, many municipalities uh, that are um, that have some form of BAS, you, you likely have dealt with this already. 
Um, um, and if you haven't dealt with remote communication, uh, it's real important that you you definitely do. This is essential for for uh, uh, for uh, BAS system and being able to keep your systems efficient. And it, just from an operational perspective, I'd just like to highlight the fact that there, you know, this will vary the the types of uh, uh, control and, and security issues will you know, will depend on your IT group. Uh, but just something that we'd like to stress that uh, you get this resort uh, re resolved or addressed early on in the uh, in your strategy in terms of getting your buildings uh, automated. Uh, again, just to highlight the fact that, you know, we talked about BACnut being very much an open protocol, a standardized communication protocol. I mean, there, there, there's challenges that comes with that too, right? So, and so, um, which leads to my third point there, uh, you know, consideration needs to be given to BAS manufacturers that use encry encryption uh, when they communicate between panels and so forth. There's, we've um, uh, <clears throat> cited, there's been many examples actually where, uh, where uh, or uh, hackers have come through a building automation system um, and actually hacked into the uh, into the owner's uh, sort of uh, the proprietary and confidential information. So that's really important. Um, also, there's other methods, there are secure methods of a single sign on that uh, uh, that we're we're seeing starting to show up. Uh, you know, lightweight direct uh, directory access protocol, and which kind of brings myself to the the uh, next question um, uh, is uh, Adrian from from your perspective, I guess having a being a BAS provider, I'm, I'm sure you're you're running into this a lot. Um, uh, what what are the IT departments of the of the clients demanding in terms of security these these, these days? Um, I think. I mean, lately it's been, it varies pretty drastically from, from client to client yep. um, with the clients that, that don't really have, have much of a, uh, of an opinion. I mean, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're, we're implementing best practices um, all the way up to certain owners that are, are very adamant and have very specific IT requirements. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, that's kind of what we're seeing, but I mean, some like, basic kind of IT practices can go, you know, a very long way in securing that network. Um, you know, something like putting all of your BAS controllers onto a segregated VLAN, um, you know, using a VPN to access your central server with like, you know, two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Yes. Um, you kind of touched on it a little bit earlier there, Frank, where you were saying um, encrypting the data. So now, you know, communications between controllers uh, between different sites, and especially if it's going over the internet, um, should really be encrypted and at the transport layer. And, and you, you can do that through, you know, the use of, of things like back into VPNs, um, which can also kind of simplify your network layout as well as kind of a side benefit. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, no, that's great. That's great. And uh, are you seeing that uh, that encryption uh, level being offered by many, like BAS manufacturers are kind of going in that direction. Most of them are offering that, and that should be an expectation of the municipality that they should see that in their in the vendors that they look they, they look for or invest or, or uh, investigating. Or I think it should be an important consideration, um, like you said, especially in the in the day and age that we, that we are in. Mm -hmm. um, some vendors have created their own um, encrypted you know, backnet VPN software. Mm -hmm. um, other vendors are, are in addition to that, you know, adopting the, um, the new backnet standard from ASHRAE, which is called backnet secure connect. Okay. So it's, a, it's a similar, similar concept to, to just basically encrypting that traffic. Okay. Um, and you kind of mentioned LDAP before. So, I mean, LDAP is nice because it allows for, you know, that the single sign on experience for the users, but, at the same time, all of the credential management is is basically managed by the organization's uh, IT group. Mm -hmm. So for whatever requirements they have for that are, are all handled there as well. Oh, okay. So kind of kind of a nice package. I see. I see. So 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 thanks. For, basically, if I can just reiterate some of the key comments there. I mean, the reality is, is that, you know, various organizations have various approaches to this. And I, that's been my experience as well, working with different organizations is that some are very sophisticated and very, very specific about what IT requirements they have. Um, and then some are a little bit more open to it, but they, I guess, can't stress enough the, the importance uh, that this is to your BAS and that you, you address this and have the dialogue with your IT departments early on, right? Great, okay, thanks, Adrian. Thanks. Uh, so, uh, 
the trends in, in data storage, which is a bit of an extension of, of, of security as well. Um, but um, one of We'll, we'll, we'll get into a little bit more details. We'll show some examples of how to use trends. But uh, one of the things that, you know, at this stage where we're talking about uh, BAS uh, procurement or, or replacement, if you will, uh, one strong recommendation is, is that we have whenever you're putting in any new controllers or things of that nature, please make sure that they set up the trends right in the initial installation. We're finding that you know, probably 99% of, um, of uh, owners and building operators that we deal with, just this is never done. Um, and, or it's done haphazardly. It's not done consistently and comprehensively. So, uh, and you'll see that the importance of trends and can't stress that enough is, is that that's that the use of trends is extremely important to really optimize your 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 building. And again, you know, hitting those uh, those pretty aggressive low carbon goals that most of the municipalities are uh, are trying to achieve. <clears throat> A couple of things to highlight that most BAS controllers have limited data storage capabilities, usually, you know, a couple of weeks. It depends on the frequency that you're recording these, uh, uh, this data, um, but understand that, that there is a limitation and, and hence, because of that, you need to consider data storage uh, for longer periods. So, uh, um, so usually having backups uh, uh, to make sure that none of this information is lost. And we recommend a minimum of two years worth of the trend logs. And the reason for that is, is, is that you'd like to compare operation over a long period of time to see likely when things problems started happening. Um, we actually recommend uh, more than two years uh, if possible. So anyways, uh, something to consider that when you, you definitely do need to consider data storage. Uh, this is often uh, often something that's been overlooked based on my experience uh, recently. And um, uh, so again, you know, when you do consider it, uh, please consider a minimum of, of two years worth of, of trend logs. And, and, and trends really don't take up too much memory. Uh, um, uh, so, um, so just something to be mindful of uh, as well. Um, ensure that you have a method, a method of, of, of extracting that data, accessing that data uh, into a meaningful report. We're going to get into more of that later um, uh, in, uh, in the discussion of trend analysis uh, and uh, even touch upon fault detection and diagnostics. Uh, next point, uh, like talk a little bit about the alarming uh, piece. Uh, so alarming uh, is is important for sure, um, but uh, just my experience generally has been is is that initially when working on BAS systems, uh, almost so there were so many things that were being put on alarms, and what ends up happening is is that people become overwhelmed <laughs> with alarms and they ignore them. Um, so that's why I'd like to stress the fact that uh, try to keep uh, only key alarms should be communicated to building operators to, again, to minimize this data overload. We're often trying to work, when we work with clients, we're trying to awfully say, put the top five or top 10. And that's, and that's really a top five, top 10, because otherwise, again, the operators become overwhelmed and they become desensitized afterwards. They won't even pay attention to alarm. So, um, so again, alarming is important, um, uh, but just in order to manage it effectively, we, we, we encourage you to uh, only use key alarms, um, set up for key alarms to communicate to, to your staff there. Uh, the BAS having remote alarming is really, really important. And, and these days with, uh, <clears throat> with handheld devices, uh, this has become more and more common this is we started seeing this back in 2000 and kind of the late late 2008 9 10 and 12 and it's becoming more commonplace these days right so when you look for a bas make sure it has the remote alarm capability some of the older ven uh older systems that you know if your system is say prior to 2010 it may not have that capability so just keep that in mind um and again the importance of this is is, is key in this in this in this age of uh, uh of uh, communication um, quick communication and communicating all uh, um, all staff and so forth to get things resolved as soon as possible uh, some things to consider as well, um, you know, critical alarms, uh, you know, some freezing free stats and things of that nature, uh, where it could cause actually damage to your infrastructure. Uh, those would be good. To, you may want to consider uh, hardwiring those to your building security panel. Um, again, this would only be for critical alarms, you know, uh, maybe one or two of them where it's a space temperature sensor in a place or your boiler loop, for instance, uh, is really in bad shape. Um, and so you want those things where, uh, where people can respond to it because uh, and they need to respond to it fairly quickly in some cases, especially when it's extremely cold um, out there as well. Uh, may, again, just just the, having to deal with the, uh, the 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 enormous amount of alarms. If uh, if you're not careful, uh, it's really it's uh, it's important to sort of set priorities and notification classes so that um, and to, to communicate the, the the severity of them. Um, otherwise, again, you get that uh, operators would tend to 
to become desensitized to them, they begin to ignore them. I've seen it all the time where they, they continue to ignore them. Because, and rightly so, there's just so many of them, how do they respond to it? So there's a need to prioritize them and classify them and try to stick to a few only. Next, uh, I want to talk about uh, <clears throat> legacy support and serviceability. So, uh, you know, interesting uh, comment from Dave uh, with respect to, um, uh, you know, uh, he's got a handful of products already that have older technology. Um, so, uh, again, kind of to my first point there, look for BAS manufacturers that support their legacy products. I mean, you get to a certain point in time where uh, eventually, um, uh, eventually, you do have to replace your components, but you don't want to be forced too early. So, um, backwards compatibility is is is, is a, very much a related factor. So, uh, look for companies that are able to communicate with their older panels, uh, even if they, uh, given as as new as BS companies come up with new panels and new technology for their panels, it's it's important that. Uh, they um, again that they communicate backwards uh, with the existing uh, existing uh, hardware, so it minimizes you or reduces the uh, or, you know forcing you to actually replace the BAS equipment and controllers well before their their end of life. I've, I've dealt with clients where where their panels are only you know 10, 12 years old and and they're stopping servicing and stop 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 servicing those panels. And so you don't want to be in that situation. So make sure you ask those questions early on and and um, and actually you know ask for evidence of that. Um, so that's important. Um, different um, <laughs> service models. So this is where I was getting about with the with, with the topic there of uh, serviceability. So uh, there's two main uh, service models uh, that we've uh, noticed that out in the industry. Uh, there's BAS manufacturers that have an integrated BAS installation and service group, if you will. Um, so companies like like Siemens have this. Uh, JCI gen generally have this as well as uh, uh, as well as Honeywell, and, and there are there are others as well. Uh, just to understand this again, it's not a criticism. It's just to highlight the differences uh, in the approaches that you need to be mindful of if you're dealing with them and if you have to escalate issues uh, during this with this model over here. You, you, you need to escalate that through the branch and upper management. But again, just always be mindful that you're dealing with the same BAS company. I've had to do this several times. It's not a problem. It just you, you're looking for a company, hopefully that has management that uh, upper management that is responsive. And and I and, and that's been generally my findings is that if I've had to go up above the branch, then um, usually they are responsive. But just be mindful of that if you are dealing with a BAS manufacturer that has an integrated BS, you have to go that route. And um, with uh, with respect to uh, BAS manufacturers. Another model is uh, you know, our manufacturers with independent installers uh, um, and service providers. Uh, and in this situation over here, if you're unsatisfied, again, I've been involved in these situations too, uh, you know, man the manufacturer themselves will recommend an alternative BAS installer service provider. So, so if you're, you're uh, the, the main difference here is that you, you don't have to deal with the same uh, service provider in this case over here. So again, a little bit of a different option, uh, if you will, but something to be mindful. Companies like, uh, you know, Delta Controls, Reliable Controls, uh, use this model. So okay. uh, something I'd like to highlight, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about it again, is uh, regarding documentation, but um, replacement of a BS. So many, uh, some of the municipalities that may be on this call, uh, you know, are considering replacing the BS, I guess, just like uh, uh, Dave mentioned that he's got three buildings that he has to replace that. So um, just wanted to highlight the fact, the importance of documentation and a good initial wiring installation. So if the documentation is good, and the wiring is done really, really well, you know, replacing a BAS legacy system, system with the same BAS provider, you can, can reduce the cost quite a bit. Uh, you know, like I mean, I'm indicating as much as 50%. Uh, and so th this, is, this is a fact, right? We've actually been working with providers that actually have done this. And, and, and again, it, it could be quite significant. So again, can't stress enough, and we'll talk a little bit more about it, the importance of documentation and making sure that the initial wiring installation is right. So for when you are, uh, even with an existing uh, BAS or if you're doing new ones, make sure that there is good documentation. Again, we'll talk more about it afterwards. If, if you are going to be replacing your BAS legacy system with a different BAS provider, it still can reduce costs, perhaps not as much as the 50%, uh, because there's uh, there's specific um, you know requirements in terms of wiring panels and things of that nature, but you can still you know significantly reduce your costs 10 to 20% or so. So, so again, I just wanted to highlight that. Uh, things to be mindful of when you're replacing your BAS that and the importance of documentation and making sure as many of you probably undertake uh, some of your facilities getting a, a new BAS or a BAS for the first time, make sure that these things are stressed. The initial wiring installation is done well and properly, well specified and well uh, commissioned and uh, inspected uh, and as well documentation is, is, is set up properly initially and maintained going forward. 
Um, next item I'd like to talk about is this one, and this is a big topic here. And training. Uh, again, as I mentioned, uh, what we're seeing is um, is a trend that uh, in order for uh, to hit a lot of the, the, the low carbon targets and really optimize uh, uh, energy usage uh, in your facilities, um, um, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of building operation owners uh, need to or are getting more and more involved in 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 their building automation system. So, um, so we just wanted to highlight the, these areas over here and to get the perspective of some of the municipalities that we have here. Um, and, you know, many many manufacturers will only provide a building level type of uh, training. Um, and what that mean, what I mean by that is, is basically how that building, uh, their BAS installation works specifically for their site. Um, um, and they will provide a service, uh, you know, some sort of service to make all the changes to the programming themselves, right? So, um, so there's, you know, pretty well all BAS manufacturers do that, but making sure that that, that uh, is, uh, is, uh, is available. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> what uh, we encourage you is to look for BAS manufacturers that provide various levels of training. And what we mean by that is, um, is that, uh, again, it just depends on your municipality and, uh, and the, st in the stage you are in terms of evolution of building automation system within your facilities. Uh, some of the more sophisticated municipalities that already have BAS in their buildings, um, um, you know, will probably be interested more in having more options in terms of training. And what I mean by that is expert training, for instance, uh, we're training where they can actually program. We, we know we are aware of some clients that actually have internal staff that actually know how to program in these systems uh, just to, you know, uh, to deal and troubleshoot with things as opposed to, to, to rely 100% on a BAS service provider. So um, if you're considering, uh, you know, depending on your, your, your stage in terms of the, your, you know, automating your facilities, the, you know, looking for that, that ability or the options of having various levels of training, including expert training um, is, is good to, is to get to consider. Um, and uh, if you plan to have a turtle staff, uh, again, a larger role with the BAS, you know, consider manufacturers that do have that. And that kind of brings me the question with um, for some of the municipalities that they don't, uh, as well as, uh, and we'll talk a little bit, we have perspective of, uh, of set point automation, uh, Adrian there. So, so we'll start with you, Adam. Um, in terms of uh, a BAS service provider and its technical support, what, what do you look for in, in that? Uh, I look for a partnership. Uh, we've had experience in the past where uh, reach out related to say a recommissioning exercise to implement an action. And I remember an example where we, we paid $2,000 to essentially recirculate a pool unit overnight, close the damper and the company came on site and then I was checking and, and it didn't work. And essentially they said, oh, we, we, we quoted you for 10 hours of work, not to actually complete yeah. the project. So we don't have that system anymore. We have a different system, but so I'm looking for a partnership where um, you work with your provider and you have an outcome that you're looking for. And in some cases, the provider will do very well when they, because they could probably do the work efficiently, but sometimes they'll run into to trouble and I don't want to get, you know, a bill for an extra controller for $1,200 because it, it's easier to wire it that way or something like that. So it's a partnership and it's challenging because if you have legacy systems, some service providers don't, they, they don't have that model, um, but others do. So I think that's the key thing. So you want to find a service provider that um, you can build a relationship to understand that there's going to be future work. And if they do good work, the, there'll be benefits to both. Okay. Okay. No, that that's very helpful. I mean, the the, the word uh, that I like you used is is partnership, and, and you're right that they're looking out for your interest, not their own. Right? To say I booked ten hours. To your point, it was a great example that you brought up, and I and just so you know, I might see that a lot. <laughs> so, so it's not it's not uh, it's not uncommon to, to see that. But but you're right. The the organizations that are going to be more successful uh, are the ones that really partner with you and understand your needs and 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 don't come back to you with that kind of a response. They'll deal with your issue, right? So so that's a key one. So thanks for highlighting that piece of it and uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit more uh, just if we can extend the, the question a little bit about uh, your your you know given the stage that you're at with your facilities what, what kind of level of expertise do you have or want to have internally um, maybe maybe you can describe a little bit what you have currently what, what's your future outlook for that in terms of expertise well I'm kind of wishing I was in Dave's scenario where you have <laughs> a common provider because you yep. can conceivably at that level, hire someone who has uh, BAS skills um, 
and and have them internally because when you start adding up all the optimization time and the improvements and even the spec reviewing uh yes. there's a benefit perhaps if you're of a certain size to have that internal resource that specializes in that but you have to be of a certain size and scale so what we're trying to do is um ensure that we understand uh controls in the sense that we have third-party commissioning we we look at the sequences we we ask the questions about integration um, so that when we put out proposals and scopes of work that we're at least asking the right questions and mm -hmm. then we have somebody to verify who's an expert that isn't the company and that's that's kind of our perspective right now it's challenging when you have different providers because you have different levels of service so that's yeah. that's where we sit at Okay, no, no, that, that's a great point that you bring up. You I mean the, the key thing here is is that you're you're right. It, it depends on the size of of uh, and how many BAS systems that you have in your facilities. And you're you're right. It makes it considerably more challenging when you have you know more than one vendor, uh, right? And and uh, and again, it's not uncommon to see that many many portfolio managers, people that manage a portfolio of buildings, will will run into uh, many different types of uh, BAS vendors on their facility, and it be, again becomes more challenging. Uh, so, it kind of brings me to uh, a question with um, with Dave. I guess Dave, I guess you're in a bit more of a luxurious spot that Adam kind of highlighted that you have one uh, uh, one sort of main manufacturer that you're dealing with. Um, what do you kind of look for with uh, look for uh, from them? Um, and then and then you know the corollary to that, I mean, is is, is the the level of expertise that you have or want to have internally to to be able to to service some of that. Absolutely, Frank. So, and, and uh, probably echoing Adam's wishes that uh, having a single source provider for the VAS really opens up some other opportunities that you might not have had uh, when you were working with different ones. Uh, I mean, we've always depended on John. We have Johnson Controls as our main provider for, for BAS, yep. and we've always depended on them to provide uh, preventive and corrective maintenance to our facilities. Mm -hmm. We have had training uh, provided by them directly to our facility operators in the past, but uh, there's always uh, staff turnaround and we do not have, we did not have that expertise to maintain the BAS uh, on site. However, uh, last year or the year before that, I can recall when that happened, we were fortunate enough to convince our senior management that we needed internal expertise to help us look after the BAS. Mm -hmm. And we were able to create a position of uh, BAS specialist within the town. So okay. we have one person working with us that has expertise on the Johnson Controls system, particularly. Okay. And that, that's helped us not only tackle some of that internal training that can happen for our staff, mm -hmm. but also troubleshoot some of the issues that we should have gone to, to our supplier to begin with. Mm -hmm. And when we hired this person, we were also fortunate enough to attract someone that was working and had been working with us in projects at the town through Johnson Control. So they already had that expertise on our facilities mm -hmm. and with the Johnson Control system. So that was kind of a big win for us that oh, yeah. uh, we were able to keep that all that all that, all that knowledge and expertise on, on staff. Okay, no, that's great. That sounds like a really like a win 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 on that one there. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you were able to do that. And yes, and, and uh, I'm sure Adam's there looking at with, with some envy. Uh, and hopefully we'll get to that point. But but you're right. I mean, that's where, where that's where the trend is going. And, um, and uh, it's good that you're able to do that. And, and again, as organizations start to head towards, you know, low carbon and stuff like that, working towards that goal. If it's not now, maybe a few years down the line, you can try to find some way of dealing with that. So something to, to consider for sure. Um, just to keep things moving here. Um, um, Adrian, just a quick, a quick comment. Uh, your perspective. We'll just try to keep this part short. Is what, 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 what a percentage of your clients like? What are your clients demanding in terms of training these days? Uh, um, you, you know, the, the different various, uh, various levels, if you will. What, what are you seeing? What are the trends you're seeing, especially now versus maybe five, ten years ago? Mm -hmm. I, I, we're definitely seeing an, an increase in, in you know, owners wanting to be more involved with the system. Uh, again, it, it varies definitely. Between from owner to owner, but um, <clears throat> like in our case specifically, um, as being an authorized dealer of reliable controls, we, we have that opportunity to send um, those individuals to, you know, expert level training offered from the vendor itself, which yeah. I think is a, a great thing for mm -hmm. everyone. 
No, no, I, no, I appreciate it. That's good. I, I think that, yeah, if, if anything we can stress here on, 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 the, on the call here is, is that it's nice to have that, that, that flexibility, the option of doing that. Whether you end up choosing to do that and having expertise in-house, I mean, that, that's something that you'll have to make a judgment call depending on what stage you are in terms of your, your BAS and automation, um, automating your facilities. But, but it's nice to have that option if you so choose to. So something to consider uh, for that. So, uh, so thanks, Adrian. Just uh, trying to move things along here, and, and we will touch upon this really quickly. Uh, but we, we we mentioned it already. The documentation um, again, just the importance that, uh, especially as you get new systems put in place, make sure that uh, there's good documentation and that you expect shop drawings. Uh, from them, from the vendor, and that they get reviewed, and always uh, make sure that not only do you get shop drawings initially, but that they're updated uh, once uh, uh, you know during the the construction period to 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 actually reflect what actually did occur, uh, and also any changes that you um, that you make after the system, you know, make a habit of it, put in process in place that any time there are any changes, you update that documentation, and uh, some of the things to consider in the as builds are you know uh, you know your, your network device list you want to know how it's wired basically how the panels and the controllers are wired uh, you definitely want a points list right you want to know where all the points are and not just a point list you want it by panel and controllers you want to know where exactly that point is uh, and and again increasingly as uh, as adam touched upon it and i'm sure dave uh, considers it important too and i know we we have lots of experience in this area we optimized a lot of the sequences this is really important to document the sequences of operation so that everyone knows. And every time you make a change to it, uh, you need to really update that documentation. And can't stress it enough that I even, we put in bold over here that if you have an existing BAS that the documentation is missing, uh, you know, really consider, strongly consider getting the original contractor to, to provide that documentation, as I mentioned to you, because of the, the, the problems and issues you can run into um, uh, with that. Uh, if you don't have it, right? The, the cost uh, implications of troubleshooting and things of that nature. Um, Adrian, just really quickly, if, uh, you know, maybe you can just comment really briefly uh, on the, the, you know, the importance of documentation from your perspective, having been in the field and, and what your company does. Yeah, no, just to echo what you said, Frank, I think it's, I think it's important. Um, like you said, network diagrams, um, uh, sequence of operations, for sure. Uh, you have to, you have to, have to, have to have that in place, um, because without it, you you really don't have anything to compare to. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's super important for sure. Okay. Good. No. Th no. Thanks. And and yes. And, and make sure that you update that as well. I mean, what we find is that they, they start off nicely. You get a sequence of operation, but we find that changes do get made. And trust me, they get made all the time. Just in my experience over the years, they always get changed because you're fine tuning things. But make sure when you're when you finally get to that point that you're updating those sequences so that you can have future reference and that they're accurate. Right. So. Um, so, so thanks, Adrian. Uh, just moving along here, um, we know in, 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 in light of sustainability in general, we know that uh, municipalities, especially having to deal with uh, many different aspects of sustainability, not just uh, you know, energy efficiency, waste and recycling. So something you might want to consider are BAS manufacturers that um, uh, have long hardware warranties. Generally, the, with that comes uh, more, more prudence, if you will, in quality. And, and because of that, they'll likely be less uh, recycling, right? If they have these long warranties, they're, they're not going to want to replace equipment or on their warranty so uh, request repair return rates uh, I, I, again um, just some like some some uh, numbers there to to uh, put things in perspective you know less than anything less than a one percent return rate uh, um, is is a good sort of metric to follow but look for long periods of time because uh, you know a company could be good for one year or two years but look for consistency right so um, again, just to highlight the fact that repairing something is better than replacing it where reasonable, right? Just to minimize waste. And, um, and, uh, and again, there are different protocols. So we won't get into a lot of them with different protocols in terms of how a BAS manufacturer recycles, but just wanted to hi highlight that really briefly uh, with all of you. So <clears throat> just kind of moving along to, uh, uh, to the next segment, if you will. Uh, BAS service level agreement, you know, things to consider. And uh, we, we highlighted the importance of your BAS, but your BAS needs to be main, maintained uh, to ensure accuracy. And, you know, initially it works well first couple of years, but you really need to maintain it just like you do with other pieces of equipment in your facilities, you know, no different than a vehicle. So, um, so uh, some things to just keep in mind, uh, you know, consider longer terms uh, with, uh, uh, <clears throat> with your service providers. A minimum, we're, we're, we're seeing that a minimum of three years is kind of the, 
is is what the trend is to to show good performance and have good outcomes uh, with an option to extend to five years if, if possible uh, you know uh, once you evaluate their performance the three years gives you a good opportunity to do that uh, we're seeing to some clients uh, including a clause in the contract to cancel within 30 days and um, notice just in, 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 unless in case you ever deal or in a situation and hopefully not in a situation where there's major non-performance issues uh, I've seen this activated you know only a handful of times but uh, and you really do need it uh, do use it but it's good to know that you have that right so something to be mindful um, uh, Adam maybe uh, just your thoughts really quickly what are the typical durations of, uh, of your BAS SLAs uh, um, and, and why uh, maybe just just your brief comments on that if you if you can uh, that's a great question in some cases we uh, canceled them uh, historically and then uh, those building automation systems would run into the ground a little bit. I think the key about these is that the, there's so many hours dedicated to maintenance, but actually verifying the efforts that are undertaken by the company is key. So what points do they check? Are they verifying? Are they calibrating? Because often it's it's uh, you know two days a year, someone shows up, they leave after a couple of hours, they send a report. But if you if you have an agreement, you want to make sure that you're there with them and you have someone who's verifying their work and checking all the things that you need. And then any issues that have arisen over the year, you say, okay, look at this point, look at that point. So if you have an agreement, it's a great opportunity to leverage that time that you're already paying for and ensuring that you're getting those, those issues kind of dealt with um, uh, all the time. Okay, okay, no, that, that's really important. And we'll get into more of the details of exactly what you mentioned there. And it's really important talking about when you do get a service level green, what is it that you include in that, right? What's the scope of work? And we'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, Dave, just uh, just your perspective on this, any 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 thoughts on uh, on durations of service level agreements that you have with, uh, with your service provider and why? I'd say we do, as you mentioned, considering those longer terms, uh, specify a minimum of three to five years and continue extending as we keep working with the same provider. And we always try to maintain that conversation and collaboration with them. We know that this is a partnership with them and, and uh, uh, we, we have as much to gain with this as they have. So we always try to bring forward our concerns, our issues. And having a, a person on board that knows more and understands more how the BAS is supposed to be working, it can help us really ensure that the company is doing what they're supposed to be doing. Mm -hmm. And I think it's just going to help us more to, to keep that collaboration going with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, thanks. That's really important. You, you stressed again the point that Adam brought up too, and and, and I get I, I agree with that totally. Is is this partnership piece of it? And it's good to see that again. It's a little bit easier when you have one vendor to to have these longer term SLAs, which is great. Um, and but glad to see that you're seeing that, and and you see the value in that, which is really really good. Um, so so thanks for that. Uh, which kind of leads into a bit of this. Uh, it's a natural fit to this section over here. What do you include in your service level agreement? And again, this is uh, becoming more and more uh, important uh, in, in focus on here. We've we've observed, uh, uh, you know, through through my my experience over the last thirty years, really is is that most of the most of these service contracts have been just time based, where they come in as Adam mentioned, or you just got a block of hours. And what they do in there is not really well defined, right? So um, basically, what we're highlighting the fact is is that we, there's a strong need to, to consider two aspects of it, to have a sort of an outcome based scope of work, which is, you know, preventative maintenance, basically, you know, things like annual sensor calibration, um, things like relative humidity sensors and temperatures, and then, and then, you know, verifying end devices, you know, things like dampers are stroking properly and valves are, are opening and closing and, and so forth. And, and then kind of running the equipment through its paces just to see if there's anything that pops out that's not there. Right. So, so that's what we're, 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 we're seeing, uh, there's more of an emphasis and a need for that piece. Uh, but in addition to that, um, what we've noticed is that we kind of started off working with clients more on an outcome space, but uh, what ended up happening is without the block hours with, with some time to deal with service related issues that are not really related to just annual calibration, uh, there was some, some issues that, that, that happened on site. So we recommend both an outcome based service work and also block hours of some sort that's relevant for your, for your facility, given the, the issues that uh, you have uh, and, um, and, and raise on it. So um, <clears throat> the, uh, I guess you, you've touched upon it, uh, uh, Adam and, and Dave a little bit here, but maybe Adam, just real quickly, you, you kind of mentioned that you're looking for more scopes of uh, scope of work that is more outcome space. Is that, is that, the, is that the case? Yeah, well, there's, I guess there's, like you said, there's block options or there's uh, prescriptive items. And yes. I think it depends on the relationship with your provider. 
I like block hours because I don't necessarily care if uh, a vendor does a certain calibration on a certain sensor if it's not crucial. But mm -hmm. if I could get that four hours for them to help troubleshoot and optimize a unit that would yep. normally cost me two grand, yep. why I prefer that. But it depends on the vendor. Some vendors don't care for that. They say, no, no, this is what we're here for. And this is okay. what we're going to do. So uh, it depends on the vendor. But I really like the idea of having flexibility with your vendors so that you could, you could use those hours to your, your best uh, impact. Okay. Okay. Good. Okay. That's interesting. Interesting perspective that you, you want that flexibility. If you choose to go outcome space and prescriptive, you can do that. Uh, you just right now you're finding the block hours kind of works for you. Uh, Dave, on your end, uh, Dave. Um, so thanks for that. I'd appreciate it. Uh, Dave, on your end, what do you, what do you, what do you, what do you have in your current uh, uh, service level agreements or your PM that you do that you, are you doing PM work uh, um, or is it more just blocks of hours of time that you're, you're, you're getting into? Uh, we're doing the same as, as Adam's doing with his facilities. We do block hours. Uh, all the facilities that we have, we get a specific number of hours per year, and we determine how we want to use them moving forward. Okay. We have a bit of flexibility with the service provider in that if we have any issues that fall outside of these, we can tackle them. Yep. Uh, and we have that understanding that they'll come into the facilities, work with our facility operators, and make sure that we're running as, as efficiently as possible. Okay, good, good. I mean, uh, just uh, how are you dealing with like, uh, you know, calibration and things like that? Do you, deal, do you do that within your block hours? Is that basically it? Yes, or? that's correct. So whatever, whatever calibration needs to happen would happen within those block hours. Okay, okay good. Okay, good to hear that piece of it. So th that's great. We're, we've noticed generally that block hours, uh, that there's been this tendency to go to block hours, but, but not a defined scope at all. And where people just come in and they have nothing to do, but other than just, okay, what does the operator you know, need? So, it, it, you know, it's glad to see that you're, that even in do you have block hours, which is what the BAS service providers do as they provide, they estimate the hours uh, is, is that kind of stuff is, is actually uh, knowing that there is some scope of work other than just troubleshooting, right? That, that they do, which is good. Yeah. So it's so great to hear that piece of it. Um, just moving along real quickly, uh, just to stay on time and on track here. Uh, no, these are just screen captures of the different areas that we think are important to focus on. I won't get into any of the details of it, but this is, you know, the mechanic, this is the prescriptive work, mechanical uh, systems, if you will. So this is just a screen capture of, of what we've actually introduced and, and see and service level agreements um, again not to go through all of it but it's the it's the the annual uh, frequency of, um, of of checking dampers so, so you can see here um, uh, over here you see an annual frequency uh, when it comes to like checking dampers checking fans and things of that nature same thing with uh, with the, these are major pieces of equipment so we'll just we'll just kind of move along here a little bit but um, I think you generally get the point over here uh, this is uh, this is the BAS panel level so that was the those were the, the equipment pieces of it um, and um, so I'm hoping that uh, so so though the again we won't get into the detail of it but things like backing up panels and things are, are important uh, here uh, the next item is the interface so this is usually your front end uh, again just things to be mindful of um, are you know again certain frequency of uh, certain types of inspections that are needed uh, and, and we see this more with more sophisticated you know clients that have had it for a long time and do have you know budget dollars too, right? I mean, this, this takes a bit more money for sure. Uh, but we find in the end, in the long run, it, it, it pays for itself in the long run anyways. Um, so again, these are just experts where they're to, to just show you of samples of what typically is included in a service level agreement where it's very prescriptive, right? And and, and things of that nature. So um, just to, to sort of, uh, just to sort of end off um, and talk and bring closure to the, uh, the service level agreement section here, um, you know, managing expectations here. So what we've, we've, we've worked with clients, uh, you know, almost as, as many as much as 10 years ago that um, that went from a just strictly block hours with no real well-defined scope of work to one where there's a combination of prescriptive and hours. Um, uh, and uh, this is this is what we've seen. We've seen a huge, uh, uh, a huge benefit. Uh, occupant complaints decrease significantly. Uh, we had a client that would have 200 complaints, you know, big client, 200 complaints a month. It went down to 50 after two or three years of uh, implementing this type of work. Repairs, just uh, another thing too, repairs and replacement of sensors and um, and then devices will increase initially if you've, uh, you know, especially older buildings that you've had to, you know, just to deal with the deferred maintenance. So, but then again, it, it does decrease significantly, right? So the demand service calls decrease over time as well. Um, and uh, buildings will operate a little bit more 
uh, more more efficiently, more consistently uh, when you have something that's more prescriptive or there's a, a defined scope of work. Uh, I know Dave and Adam, even though they they say their their contracts are not necessarily you know perhaps as the as prescriptive as what I've mentioned over there, but it sounds like they're in in those hours there there's an expectation of a certain scope of work, and so we encourage you to to consider that, especially in the long run, to uh, to to make sure that your systems are running optimal. Um, <clears throat> Adrian, just in the interest of time here, maybe you can just uh, just maybe just describe really briefly what, what trend you're noticing, uh, you know, being in in in, in this uh, in this arena uh, of the service level agreements. What do you what are you seeing uh, in terms of um, you know the scope of work? Is it uh, becoming more and more uh, prescriptive in, in nature where the scope is then or is it just strictly uh, ours what, what's your general sense we're definitely seeing a mix of, of both um again it's it's very client dependent so like adam and dave were saying you know they they prefer that that block model um block hour model um where we have some other clients that 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 prefer that as well um but again we are doing some very you know defined scope of work type uh service level agreements as well. Okay. 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 That's good. That's, that's good. And I, and I think I just want to highlight the fact that is, is that nothing's really wrong with buying block hours because that's how BS companies will estimate it. And in fact, we encourage that when, if you do go for very prescriptive, that you encourage the hours expectations uh, to do that work. Uh, but I think they can't stress enough that you put some boundaries on the scope of work that's related to the hours. That's all. Um, and it sounds like uh, that's what uh, I guess yourself, Adam and Dave are doing in your facilities, even though you have block hours, there's an expectation of an outcome of it. It's not just coming in and just, you know, troubleshooting, you know, randomly. Right. So, so, so that's good. Good to hear. Um, thanks. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Adrian. Uh, just kind of moving along to another key area, or, uh, which is where I'd like to spend a bit of time on um, just being mindful of the time that we have. We have it's two or five right now, but I think I can get through this pretty quickly. But I, I do want to stress the importance of trends, trends and analysis of this information. We touched upon it in the uh, in the earlier slides, uh, the importance of trends is, is extremely critical, especially these days uh, uh, when you're trying to optimize your systems, as, as we're, we heard from uh, both Adam and, and, and Dave, uh, that they're trying to do in their facilities and, and what most municipalities uh, either are doing or need to do to, to achieve those uh, low carbon goals. Um, so, <clears throat> uh, you know, just a little bit about trends uh, uh, for those uh, that are not familiar with the, the different types that exist. You know, basically, there's a, there's a mix of them. Uh, there are uh, interval-based uh, type of trends that that uh, such such as uh, analog points, such as temperature and humidity. You you read you have uh, them pulled every five or ten or fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes seems to be the standard, but it's important that when they get set up, they get set up with that interval in place. Uh, tend to to not want anything less than uh, less than uh, or more than 15 minutes uh, we, we we find that if you have more than that if they're just hourly readings you don't get into the granularity that you need and sometimes you need even five minute intervals but um but uh, that's what we mean by the uh, the analog and then um and digital points you know enable things coming on and off or or scheduling, and then we'll show you an example shortly of, of, of a combination of these different items over here. But these typically are set up for change of value. Um, but uh, you know, the next item there, where we talk about you know some points having both types of trends enabled, is 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 important, and that will become more and more important. Uh, this part over here about having them. Um, uh, you know, being able to trend it in both manners is, is becoming more and more important as you become more sophisticated, uh, or the need for sophistication to, to do the deep energy uh, recommissioning that's required. And again, we'll show you an example of that. Uh, that uh, What is important, and we'll get a taste of it too, is, is a reporting tool that can help you uh, mine this data uh, as well. Um, and, uh, and so having good you know, graphical tools, if you will. Some B many BS companies have some sort of graphical packages uh, that uh, that provide this type of uh, offering. So just be mindful of that and look into that, investigate that. Um, <clears throat> Basically, it's good to to uh, we, we talked about trends and the importance of archiving them. Uh, so having it over a long period of time, so that you can actually uh, see <clears throat> see if they're op operating uh, as per the sequences of operation. That's really where it comes down to is saying, well, with this equipment is supposed to operate in this manner. Is it actually doing that? And I could tell you from personal firsthand experience, you know, ninety nine percent of the time, uh, you know, BAS provider will go in 
and program it. But if, if they don't have a verification process, and many don't, just so you're aware, it's just the reality of it. Not that all of them don't, but many don't, uh, that they don't use trend logs, but, but demand that they do that when you do get uh, you know, sequences of operation and they indicate that they've implemented it, show me proof. And that's where trends come in. Show me proof through trends that it's actually working as intended. And that's, uh, and, you know, and, and, and I heard Adam say that and, and Dave Harp on that uh, as well. So this is a, excuse me here, this is a, an important uh, thing to keep in mind as well, sorry. Um, so the, uh, again, just the, the types of trends that should be, basically all, Key equipment points should be trended, you know, air handling units, fans, uh, boilers, chillers, and pumps. Like me, uh, these days it's real important, but the big equipment for sure, air handling units, boilers, and chillers in terms of priority. But uh, but it's not that difficult once you demand it of your service provider, your man the other manufacturer, when you're getting this thing installed to get them all set up because uh, they become they come in very handy after the fact. Um, just kind of moving um, uh, along here uh, to the next uh, slide here. Um, so again, we talked about the two years of history, uh, being able to access the trends. We talked about that and, and uh, inside and outside of the BAS. So, uh, you know, being able to access this remotely uh, is important. Um, uh, so, so that's good. And visualizing trend data, which I'll get into now. So to just give you some perspective on the type, some of it is inherent within the uh, BAS uh, organ companies themselves, but some of it is, uh, we'll touch upon it a little bit. It's, it's fault detection and diagnostics. So let me just see here. So, okay, lots of information here, <laughs> but we'll try to keep this up. I felt, felt, we felt that it would be good to have just a real life example here um, with respect to, so, so you can relate to it. And, and this, is a, this is actually a, a real life situation over here. So I'd like to highlight here that the, the, um, the goal of this, uh, uh, of this exercise here is, this specifically is to, to look at um, examining you know, temperatures and set points. Uh, uh, so um, if you're looking at uh, the heating loop temperature, we wanna make sure that it resets during an occupation periods. I mean, the whole point of this is, is that uh, during unoccupied periods, we want the building uh, to use less energy, right? So there's no need to heat it when there's, or heat it as much, if you will, uh, reduce the unoccupied temperature setback. Um, so we're looking for the fact, you know, is it actually doing that? <clears throat> and if the return water temperature uh, to the boilers, if you will, uh, ends up, um, uh, ends up actually, uh, if, if, it, if it's an, a, an operable region, we, we want to make sure that it doesn't uh, damage the boiler. So we be mindful, and, and we'll still can't stress this enough, that energy efficiency doesn't have to compromise. In fact, it should never, ever compromise the, uh, the integrity of the equipment. So uh, ensuring that the return water temperature is above 140. So just quickly here on that, on the first point over here, this is the unoccupied periods. Uh, the, the purple line over here is the set point of the building loop. So this is the water temperature going into the building. Um, so the set point does go to 90 degrees, which is great. That's the purple piece. But the actual temperature of the loop, this green line over here, you can see that it doesn't. <laughs> and so anyways, so even though the set point is there, uh, it's not actually happening. So again, this is how you can use trends to to, to understand if your building is working as intended. Again, uh, programming is such that uh, the set point does reset, but actually it's not actually happening. Uh, and the same thing on the return water temperature side of the, you know, the item number two over here, uh, we have this uh, this line over here, which is uh, uh, the boiler return water temperature to uh, boiler number two in this specific facility. You could see here, here's the, the 150, sort of degree range and here is uh, you know in and around the 140 range and then and then you're able to with uh, with the csv files the files that you get from the trends to see is it actually going below 140 right so anyways that's how this the you know trends can be useful at least when it comes to temperatures and set points um wanted to give you a, a bit of a taste for that but also want to give you a taste for uh, other types of uh, analysis so in this case over here again same building here uh, but uh, different uh, different part of the sequence that we're testing so we want to make sure in this case over here, we're investigating trends to make sure that only one boiler operates at, at a time and that burner fluctuations are reasonable. So, so here um, you can see here the, the red line here. This is the burner operation of, of boiler number two. Um, and uh, you can see over here, this is boiler number one. So first point is, is that only one boiler is operating. Boiler one is off here uh, and boiler two is running. So good. It, that, that part works and the fluctuation isn't unreasonable. This is, this is good. Um, the other thing too is, is that we're looking for if the heating mixing valve goes to a minimum position during unoccupied periods. And so that, that is this piece over here. So the fact that um, this valve position with this green line over here, so this is unoccupied periods. Um, and then the valve is actually going to, in this case here, 30%, okay? And over here, you can see here that when boiler number two is off now, 
which is the case over here. Boiler number one starts to kick in and it's the only one operating and the fluctuations, you know, burner fluctuations are reasonable. They're not, uh, they're not crazy, they're not cycling throughout this whole graph. So, so again, just showing proof, further evidence of how you use trends and the importance that they're actually working, that your equipment is actually working as intended, right? So, um, the, uh, the next uh, item real quickly, this is the last of them. So <laughs> a bit of a brain cramp for you, but this is a, this one's important. Uh, uh, this is examining status as we talked about, you know, things that are enabled and disabled. So over here, we're just, again, operating one boiler at a time. So these two items over here represent the burner of boiler one, and this is the status uh, or the enable, if you will, on boiler one. Um, so they kind of go together, they work together. And this is uh, the same for boiler two. And this is the schedule. So we got five points over here. Um, and so you can see here that, you know, during, these are actual days, this is actually March. Um, and, um, and so, hold on, uh, and sorry, complications of being at home. Uh, and, um, and so, uh, so you can see again, only one boiler is operating at one time. Uh, boiler two is operating here right till Thursday. And then uh, Friday kicks in or, or the end of Friday kicks in is around noon, uh, boiler one kicks in. So again, this is just telling you, yes, uh, only one boiler operates at one time. And then, you know, wondering, uh, making sure that the occupant the schedule is actually switching between occupied and unoccupied. So this is occupied, this is unoccupied, uh, again, occupied, unoccupied. And you can see it's consistently happening. And on the weekend, it's a little bit longer, the unoccupied periods, uh, which makes sense. Again, this is just a, another example of how you, you verify that. The um, uh, the Just in the interest of time here, where this is one view that we just wanted to highlight um, is is that this is a lot of information here, but it's basically those three uh, trends that we showed you in the three different slides. This is a consolidated view. And the importance of, of this is when you get a little bit more sophisticated is to help you with the troubleshooting, right? The main thing is, is if you remember in the first slide of what we were having a problem with the, uh, with the valve, the valve, uh, uh, sorry, the temperatures being, uh, the set points being set back, this purple line, but the actual temperature in the loop wasn't going back. And so by having all of this information all on one, which is kind of a this is this is becoming more and more commonplace in, in fault detection and diagnostic tools as well as some BAS manufacturers may have this but we're trying to understand why that's actually happening and, and the answer really is this and this is a real life example is, is that this mixing valve has a minimum position it's set for 30 percent here uh, and this is one boiler operating so basically having to see all this 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 valve position set at 30 percent is, is allowing too much water to go into the building loop so 30 percent of the water uh, goes into the primary loop and and, um, and the, the, that minimum of water that has to stay high, hot temperatures, that goes into the building loop. And that minimum is just set way too high in order for this to reset. So, you know, the, 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 you know after being able to view all of these in a consolidated view, we're able to investigate why this is happening. And, 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 and the answer to this one here, and we're, we're working on it currently, is reducing this to, you know, 10 or 15 percent as opposed to the 30 percent. And it's already brought this line closer to uh, over here as well. Right. So um, so <clears throat> so that's. Uh, so that's the consolidated view uh, piece of it, and um, the wanted to talk a little bit about uh, the importance of this um, um, and uh, the training that goes associated with it. As you can tell, there's you know there's lots of um, uh, lots of trends and a lot of information over there, but I uh, wanted to highlight the fact that you know BAS providers can provide you know, training on how to do this, so, you know, site specific training that I talked about in the past, uh, in the previous slides, um, um, you know, and their interpretation, most BAS uh, providers, uh, you know, do have that capability, but look for that in your providers that they, they have, uh, you know, uh, uh, training capabilities and and really understand your site, really getting to know your site and, and to interpret those results. And they can also help you uh, depending on, uh, you know, how far down the path you want to go in terms of having internal staff and how to interpret that and how to resolve issues. Um, you know, setting up trends is, 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 is knowing how to set up trends is, is important um, and understanding how to deal that with a different point. Again, you can, you, you can do that uh, internally or you can try to uh, um, try to have your BS service provider provide that piece. Again, that could Consolidated views, uh, just wanted to highlight the fact that I already mentioned briefly is that there's some BAS uh, organizer, most of them actually have some software of some and dashboards of some nature to view multiple trends. Um, just be mindful of that. But just one of the things that I'll touch upon after this is really the, the that consolidated views is becoming very, very common uh, in the world of fault detection and diagnostic software, which I'll, I'll talk about a little bit briefly. But just to pause really quickly here, um, um, just Dave, uh, Dave, maybe just 
starting with you because I always pick on Adam first. <laughs> um, just, just maybe you can give us uh, some feedback on how you currently use trends uh, in uh, in managing your buildings. I'd say that unfortunately we don't use trends as much as we should be, and I, I have to go back to some of the statements you mentioned at the beginning, Frank. Is that we that we have too many trends, to, we have too many alarms, too many points of contact, that, and we haven't really had someone to look after the BAS as a whole. Yeah. So I think we first need to clean up our trends and alarms, and then we can start thinking about looking at the more critical operations, and, and instead of just focusing on, well, something's going on in the building, what happened, let's fix it, and then go back and, and figure out what went wrong. Yeah, so, that, that's that's a good, yeah, that's a good response. And that's very, Dave, that's a very common thing I hear, uh, just so you know that uh, that it's, you, you're at various stages in your evolution with your building automation system. What I'm referring to over here is really during the, it's a recommissioning type of activity, uh, as well as, you know, when you're, when you're really sophisticated, when all your buildings are kind of really working well, and you're really getting into it. Some, some, you know, it looks like in, 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 you're not alone, many, many municipalities and other clients in general are just trying to get their buildings automated. <laughs> so, there's a lot to deal with over here so but uh, yeah, good to good to hear that uh you know you're going to be looking towards doing that um piece of it and it's totally understandable that you're, you're you're not there yet right many most organizations aren't right so um thanks thanks for that dave uh, adam your perspective on this where's your head uh, tr trending <laughs> is uh trending trending is critical uh so what we've done in the energy group is we essentially I think we have 16 building automations systems. Okay. You learn the key, the key uh, uh, trend points to check, if not daily, but typically when you have a switch of weather. And uh, I do it often, and, and my colleagues do it often, where you go in and you check the four or five trends in the building, and you're able to quickly diagnose if certain things are happening. And often heat wheels fail or something like that. And so you can go and quickly check the three things. and. In the past, what would happen is we get a bill and our gas would go up 30% for a month. But now it's like, oh no, the heat wheels failed. Um, so let's get that fixed or there's some other sequence issue. So it is critical. And once you know which points are the most important from an optimization perspective in a building, check those on a regular basis and you can really catch things that go, uh, go sideways or you can find further opportunities for optimization. Okay, no, that, that's good. Again, again, uh, great to see it. I, I know that we've uh, we've communicated in the past, and, and that you do focus on trend logs, and and that is when you're at that stage where you're really trying to keep your buildings uh, efficient, and and you're, you're you don't want to be surprised by those big energy bills. <laughs> uh, that is what you need to do. That, that's the reality of it, right? So it's good to see that you know that's the stage you're at right now, and um, and and we encourage that as uh, as municipalities become more more involved in in, in involved in trying to get their buildings efficient, that they do that. That's that's a necessity really when you when to, to get to the levels in, in terms of it but we understand that um, you know that each municipality is at a different stage in evolution with their building automation system but something to keep in mind for sure uh, so thanks so thanks uh, thanks for that um, just kind of moving on to and touching this really quickly we're kind of at the tail end of this and we want to leave just a couple of minutes for for um, for questions here but taking it to the next level fault detection again this is probably beyond most municipalities but we've been fortunate enough to work with uh, some clients that are at this level and we've seen it work, uh, but just wanted to highlight uh, what fault detection and diagnostics, what it, what it is. Uh, some of you may know of it, um, uh, but just want to describe it. Basically, a fault is, is this is the closest thing to, you know, artificial intelligence. And this is kind of like when, you know, you're really sophisticated and you have the funds, because we understand that municipalities are always constrained with funding budgets, um, is, is that um, basically it's a fault, it's an anomaly. Um, so instead of having, uh, you know, someone look at trends all the time uh, themselves, which is a good good thing to do anyways, this here just takes it to the next level and highlights all the problems, you know, things that are just not operating properly. So it'll detect things of that nature. So FTD is really, uh, these days, FTD can be used to optimize your building operations, um, um, can be, um, but you need to have someone that really knows what how to optimize the building just it's a bit, a bit of caution uh, but the, what's really important is, is when you're when you're ready for it again this is more the more, more when you're more sophisticated is that it can and should be used to sustain optimal operation um, and just talking about the different types of its capabilities there's some that uh, 
uh, for real-time fault detection. Some uh, use historical. Most of the most ones that we've dealt with use trend logs. Again, trend logs are at the at the very much the foundation of all of this. Um, and um, again, graphical analysis is common. I just showed you that consolidated view. That is from an FTD provider. In fact, that is from uh, from SkySpark, uh, which is from uh, York that Yorkland uh, uh, controls represents. Uh, we use that. That is one sample of the type of software that FTD does. Uh, but uh, dashboards are very common in these platforms. Some BAS providers uh, have their own version of it, but they're also uh, independent versions uh, as, as well. So um, uh, the uh, just a question on uh, on this, Paul. Uh, just wanted to get your your, your perspective on this. Um, what's uh, what's been your uh, observation over the last five years on the uptake of uh, fault detection and diagnostics? Sure. So you know we've seen a tremendous amount of uptake over over the last five years in analytics, and and I would say FDD is is really a subset of, of what we would call analytics. Yeah. Um, and you know even with the tremendous amount of uptake, we're probably still looking at just the tip of the iceberg. There's there's a lot of a lot more buildings out there um, that need this type of of uh, solution. I'd make one comment on you know having funds. Um, available to do this type of work specifically for the municipalities. Um, just a comment on what you just said. Now, unlike a BAS system, you can start applying analytics and fault detection to just a very small subset of your building. You don't have to do the entire thing and you can generate tremendous value with a small set. So I just wanted to, yeah. to put, that, put that out there. Um, yeah. I think, you know, in terms of the uptake, I think uh, some parts of the world are, are much faster in, in, at adopting new technologies than others. Mm -hmm. and others. Um, and you know, certainly owners and operators have become more familiar with uh, the value of data and how to improve the performance of their buildings and their energy utilization. Mm -hmm. And I think that the conversation is really beginning to change more from a general education um, to more specific, you know, advanced use cases like GHG tracking, tariff rate analysis, and really workflow tools, probably most importantly, workflow tools that can take you from the you know initial identification of the the problem or the the fault all the way through resolution and tracking it all along the way. Yeah, yeah. So no, thanks. That that's very helpful, Paul. And thanks for highlighting the fact that you know you can start off small, um, you know, just to pilot it, see how it goes. And and you're right. I, I'm seeing it. This is a very pronounced in certain verticals uh, that we're seeing. That, again, some leading edge organizations. And then we also you know understand and 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 that you know some of um, some some vertical sectors you know are, tend to be a little bit slower to the game. But glad to see that it's actually you know, the awareness is is being raised and that you're starting to see an increase. Uh, this is all about big data and handling it this is the future for sure and uh, again just don't want to spend too much time on this part of it because a lot of sure. the organizations are uh you know a lot of municipalities are kind of getting their buildings automated but this is one thing you definitely need to keep in mind right so uh, let's uh, let's just i wanted to make sure that we for those or municipalities that are at this stage or considering it this is something these are the kinds of things that you need to be mindful of um just to we, we're kind of really running out of time here but i just uh, just to talk about the process really quickly um is is that uh, as paul mentioned it's big data uh, just be mindful of the fact that you know there's a process that needs to be put into place for this um, and um, you know it, the you know, faults would you know, you're going to have quite a few faults if you don't implement this properly and you can get easily overwhelmed. So, but it's important, I guess, as I, as I talked about to having a, a current sequence of operation because the faults won't work. Um, again, and, and similar to alarms, but this takes it to a whole new other level. You need to prioritize them and and um, and uh, usually, usually needs to be managed through uh, another process. Really, really quickly here, just in the interest of time here, um, I know we're down to the last four or five minutes uh, on this piece over here, um, but uh, Maybe we'll we'll kind of uh, end it off here in terms of the fault detection and diagnostics, because it sounds like uh, most most organizations, are, at least on the call, likely aren't there yet. Uh, but certainly appreciated, and I want to can't stress enough the importance of having this. But uh, uh, Catherine, just uh, just in the interest of time here, we don't have many time many <laughs> many uh, many much time for questions and answers. But can um, can you sort of uh, uh, bring some of those questions up or? Uh, sure. So we have a question um, here related to some content from the beginning. Uh, someone's looking for um, perspective or experience regarding portfolio-wide BAS systems versus standalone systems and getting a little bit more into some of the advantages and disadvantages of each. Mm -hmm. um, okay, that's that's good. And, and um, 
um, my, uh, oops, I'm just trying to minimize that piece here. I mean, uh, yeah, my, my perspective is, is that for, uh, and, and again, you know, Adrian and, and please chime in and others, but uh, my, my perspective on this is, is that if, as you're looking out for, for the future and, and building your infrastructure, it's really important that you, you look at a consolidated view of BAS systems that that can integrate with each other. That that can look at multiple buildings. You you should, should try to stay away from BAS that are standalone or that are more individual focused. That can't be viewed. Uh, as you you heard Adam talking about it. You heard Dave talking about it. The fact that they've got this huge portfolio of buildings. You you want to have at, you know one point of access, if you will, to be able to see all their all the facilities, right? Because we're going to be dealing with carbon the carbon reduction and climate change for the next thirty years. Uh, so if you're if you're at that stage where you have a choice in what a BAS gets put into your system, definitely strongly consider systems that are very much open uh, and that um, that you can view uh, a portfolio of them. Um, and there are many, many BAS uh, companies and manufacturers out there offer that ability to look at more than one building. Uh, it's becoming more and more commonplace and I strongly encourage you to do that. Uh, Catherine, anything else uh, that you might want to highlight? I know that uh, we've talked a lot. Uh, yeah, we have a few that are somewhat technical that I think would be best to be answered in the question and answer document that we'll be providing following the webinar. Sure. Um, yeah, because I think they're going to be a little bit longer answers that we may not have time for and people will probably be easier to see a text written version of the answers. Sure. So thank you everyone for your questions and we'll make sure that anything that was um, any questions that you have will be answered in that document and it'll be easier to reference for you anyway. Okay, great. Okay, so 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 that's great. A lot of information here, uh, uh, folks. Uh, so, mm -hmm. uh, but again, uh, hopefully you found it interesting. It was great to to have the panelists here and get their perspective on things, um, all of them. So, so thanks, uh, thanks to uh, Adam. Dave, uh, Adrian, and Paul uh, for participating in this and, and giving their their expertise and their, their their perspective on things. So appreciate that. Yes, yes, I just wanted to reiterate that as well. Thank you so much to our panelists. Uh, that was really excellent information. And thank you, Frank, for facilitating the discussion today. I think it was really, really useful for people. Um, as I mentioned, as we didn't have time to address all the questions, we will make sure they're answered in the Q&A, which will be posted on the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge website, along with uh, the recording of the webinar and the slide deck as well. And if anyone has any questions about any of the content, or if you think of questions after, any questions about the Mayor's Megawatt Challenge program in general, please feel free to contact me at uh, the email that you, oh, Frank, you just scroll through to the last. Oh, did I? Second. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Okay. Go I think ahead, everyone has my email anyway, but there it is, in case you okay. have any questions for me. Please feel free to reach out. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much, it? everyone. Take okay, care. Thanks, Have a good everybody. rest of your day. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.